I'm pleased to welcome Quentin Tarantino back to this table. It has been a time since we came here to talk about, first we talked about Pulp Fiction, then we talked about Jackie Brown, but the Pulp Fiction conversation uh, on anybody's list of favorite programs that they have seen in the last 12 years on this show, he's on that list. So it's great to have you back. It's, a, it's an honor to be back, actually. <laughs> I had to make a movie good enough to come back to do it. <laughs> All right. What have, you, what have you been doing for the last six years? Give me the whole sense of, mm -hmm. of leading up to this since right. the last movie you made. Yeah, uh, well, basically, you I mean, know why I'm asking because uh -huh. I caught you on a plane one night, yeah, right, late yeah. at night. Yeah, exactly. It was an overnight plane from, I think, L.A. Yeah, and and I go yeah. to bed and I look over and you're scribbling away. Mm -hmm. I wake up and you're scribbling away. Yeah. I said, <laughs> Quentin is under pressure. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, basically, what I was doing in that time, uh, you know, along with a little bit of living life and everything right. like that, was I was writing. Right. All right, I was going to do this uh, uh, World War II movie. Right. You know, uh, first, and so I started writing that. And, Hell, that was like at least six months of research right, right there, all right? And so I started writing that. And then along the way, it started becoming this never-ending novel. Have you heard of a novelist that you have this tomb, <laughs> yeah, all right? They, they can right. never end. A okay. trunk full of notes. Yeah, okay. This is a script, all right? <laughs> and it's like this, and I can never end it, all right? And then... Um, and then finally, I just said, you know, I think I'm going to switch over to something else for a little bit. And then I uh, started writing Kill Bill. But uh, and that took about two years, you know, about a year and a half altogether. So the thing is, during that time, I was working. I was just writing. All right. You know, and I'm you know, writing it like the way a novelist writes. You know, I'm just kind of alone and just doing it. I don't have like cards or graphs about this has to happen. By and this do you write it or that in page. longhand? Yeah, totally write in longhand. And I, I know where I'm going, but it's like, you know, it's you know, I want to do it like a novelist does, where it's like it, they're telling me. They can, you know, the characters can kind of go wherever they want. I push them in a certain direction, but then they kind of tell me the story. Like, for instance, in the case of Kill Bill, it's like, you know, I pretty much figured by the time we got to the end of the movie, she'd kill Bill. Right. But exactly <laughs> what their conversation would be, I didn't know. Exactly what they would say once they got to each other, I didn't know. And I wouldn't know until I'd gone on that year and a half journey of getting the bright to there. Yeah. Well, here's what amazes me. I want to talk, first of all, the World War movie, since you brought it up here, why can't you end it? I mean, what was it? You could mm -hmm. not, you could not find in your head mm -hmm. some logical mm -hmm. concluding mm -hmm. episode yeah. to sew it up. You know what it was more than anything else? It was, uh, it, it was writer's itis. I just couldn't let go of it. I mean, there was this weird thing about it where... I had, uh, I had directed Jackie Brown, and then I had then acted on this play and everything. And then it was like, okay, the writer in me, okay, now deal with me, all right? Let me take over. And like, great, it's time for you to take over. Well, like, l let him take over. And I just, just became too precious about the page. It was like, had to be the greatest thing I'd ever done. And I just couldn't stop writing. I couldn't turn my head off. It's just like, you keep coming up with another idea after that and another idea after that. And by the way, this is a movie, all right? It can't just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it did, but I was so in love with the page, I couldn't stop. I mean, now after I've done Kill Bill, I know how to end it. I know how to do all of that. But at that moment when, you know, everything was about that, I just couldn't get away from the desk. Do you view this World War II movie as your masterpiece? Well, uh, so far, having not filmed a single page of the script. Yeah, uh, what I would say, uh, I, I, I'd say the, what I have written so far, all right, is the best stuff I've ever written. Best stuff you've ever written. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is it that makes a Tarantino script? Because the dialogue is so riveting. Mm -hmm. Just watch the way they were talking there. I mean, you just you compel forward. Mm -hmm by the way people talk to each other. That's one thing. How do you create that? Well, <laughs> I really know it might, it might all go away. But I mean, um, basically what, what I do... What, what informs it? No, I, yeah, well, what I do basically is, and this sounds... Um, I get them talking to each other. I mean, it's just it's just that simple. All right. And uh, you've got a good ear. Yeah, I got I got a very good ear. And there is a lot of aspect when it comes to writing that relates to acting, all right? The way, like, uh, uh, two actors would improvise or something like that. But it's not... There's not that show offy. Uma has a great line about it. She goes, Look, if an actor is improvising and they're not using curse words, that's not improvise that's not improvisation. That's writing. All right. right. That's why you never see it. All right. If they're gonna improvise, they're gonna cuss. Yeah. All right. And so what happens is I just get the characters talking to each other. And what you're trying to do is create an environment as you're writing that Quentin isn't doing it. 
they're doing it. Quentin starts it off. Quentin knows the direction it's supposed to go. But then the characters take it over. All right. And then like an uh, analogy I'll make is, OK, uh, say I'm going to write a scene. And I'm going to get to the coffee cup right, right over here and I'm heading him that way. And then all of a sudden the characters make a left turn and they start going over here. Well, that's OK, because that could end up being the best stuff in the in the whole scene. Eventually, they'll work their way over here if they're supposed to go over here. Yeah. If they never get their way back there again, well, that was Quentin's idea and it wasn't yeah. a good one. And they were keeping me on. <laughs> And the characters are better than Quentin at that point. Oh, hands down. It hands down. I mean, I to to do it the really the right way, I should be like a, a a court reporter or a court stenographer. I'm just jotting it down. They're doing it all. And then like the director comes in after the scene's all ex you know, I, 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 I shot it out. All right. Then I, I go and kind of clean it up. All right. But here's the question. What is it you have that most people don't without flattering yourself though? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something you have. Yeah, well, I'm like, I mean, I guess that I guess that's God given talent. The I mean, sense of hearing conversation and understanding yeah. the nuances of the way people react to each other. I mean, it's really weird because I mean, if you try to pin me down on exactly what my right. religion is, I would be evasive. All right, but I guess I do believe in God, and half the reason I do believe in God is because I, I guess I believe in God given talent, and it's like, and it, it's easy for me. All right, and it's just mm -hmm. the stuff that's easy for you. It's obviously not me doing it. <laughs> yeah. But is it the thing that you do best? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's the thing that I could yeah, yeah, it's the thing I do best. Put stuff on a page. Yeah, I mean, when it comes when it comes to dialogue, it's what I do best. I, mean, I think I'm I'm pretty good at doing a whole lot of other things. Right. But that's it's the thing that I'll put my up against anybody. Do you ever want to work with other people's dialogue with other people's script? Uh, oh no! I've read scripts that have fantastic dialogue that you would direct. Yeah, that that, that I'm uh, that I well, you know, no, I write my no. own stuff. So I mean, it would have to really knock me out and everything. And I, I kind of want to rewrite everything just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> then talk to me about the editing process because uh -huh. someone once said that Fred Astaire talked about dancing. He said, you know, what I do, I create a thirty-minute piece, then I cut it in half, mm -hmm. and then I take two more minutes off. Yeah, yeah. That's uh -huh. the way you do it. I mean, right, yeah. is that what happens? So you create this dialogue, mm -hmm. or when you put it on the page, is mm -hmm. it pretty much there. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, well, I think you should get it on the page. Get it to exactly where you where you want it to be. Where like, okay, it's right there. Like if, if the studio said, you know, take out a line. No, I won't do the movie. It'll not work without that. All right. But that's how the page is supposed to be. All right. Yeah. But then you do then you do the scene. And once you get the actors together and everything, it's like, okay, uh, lose that line. That's a crappy line. Okay, that was that's a dud. All right. Lose that one. Hey, how about say this instead? I mean, just you monkey with it just a little bit. That's fine tuning. Yeah, that's just fine tuning. But then when I get in the editing room, then when it comes to the dialogue scenes, you know, even though some people might disagree with it after seeing all the dialogue scenes I have, how long they are, uh, I'm pretty brutal with it. All right, it's like okay, screw that line, that's no good. Screw that line, that's no good. And I, and I start then I start trying to pack it in. But is it because it's no good, or because you simply have to make it tighter, tighter, tighter? No, no, no. I'll never cut a dialogue scene just for like a running time. Oh, just for thing. no, but just for momentum and rhythm and all that. Yeah, no, no, no. If it's all good, then. <laughs> It's all good, all right, you know. Uh, but no, it's more like you got to be kind of you, you got to be kind of brutal with it, just to make sure. Okay, is that line really, really working? I mean, there's an, actually a nice little rewrite that happens on uh, my scripts, especially when it comes to dialogue. Uh, after I get through uh, auditioning actors, yeah. because now I'm actually seeing it on the floor for the first time. I'm not even talking about rehearsal. I'm just having actors coming in reading scenes. I'm hearing real people say them. Yeah. All right. And, and so, what does that do for you? Well, one, it's like it's actually kind of amazing. All right, because. <laughs> I've just been hearing it in my own voice forever because I'm always like, yeah. I'll write a scene and I'll read it to somebody on the phone or something yeah. or read it to a friend. So it's always just been in my voice. So then when I actually hear other people say it, you know, it's like, oh, and there's a lot of humor in my stuff. So I, I see a joke that doesn't work or I see a line that people keep constantly tripping. Well, that's not coming out of the tongue easy enough. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard. All right. Uh, or like an actor just does some stupid little improv. They say one thing instead of what I wrote. Hey, that's pretty good. You know, I write that down. But I'll bet you that Tarantino aficionados mm -hmm. can listen to dialogue and not know whether they if they, even if they hadn't heard it before yeah uh -huh. and they can tell if mm -hmm. they hear five pieces of which two are yours they'll pick the two out it's just that distinctive well you know but the thing is you know if if if, if richard Pryor didn't do monologues if he did what i did if he was like put all his monologues into characters mouths all right yeah. and create a realistic yeah. dialogue yeah. i'd be able to tell richard Pryor. all yeah, right of course, if right. i'd be able to tell uh, howard hawks now actually what i'm when i say i'm telling howard hawks I'm recognizing Howard Hawks. I'm actually recognizing Lee Brackett, Jules Firthman, all the writers who wrote for him. All right. Yeah. But there is a Howard Hawks sound to the dialogue. Yeah. Is it better because you direct it? Well, it's, I mean, uh, I mean nowadays. You can direct your stuff better than anybody. Well, it's, well, I mean, actually, one of the best movies that, that in my 
oeuvre is True Romance, which Tony Scott directed. Yeah, right, right. But I think, I mean, now it might go in the opposite direction where maybe a director would be too faithful with my stuff. I mean, I can slash and burn it if I want, all right? Yeah. But before, I think it's the uh, situation of, uh, I'm the only one that has the true confidence in my stuff. Uh, I have the confidence in my stuff that another hired director would not have. Why is True Romance one of your favorites in your body of work? Well, it's like, a, well, a couple of things. It's like, it's the first script I ever wrote. That's all right. Yeah. And uh, that's one. And two, it's a pretty accurate portrayal of me and where my, where I was at at 25. I mean, if, uh, you know, I wrote it when I was working at the videos for video archives right, right, and, right. and all those guys, that, I mean, none of that stuff ever happened. All right. Uh, but having said that, to us who worked in video archives, it's like a, a weird big budget home movie of our lives. That was our psyche. That was where we were at that time, you know, not yeah. with gangsters and stuff. And I had actually never had a girlfriend at the time when I wrote that script. So that How was old like, were you? I was 25. I was a late bloomer. All right. Uh, I would say. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, so it's like, I, mean, I went on a whole lot of first dates. I went on a lot of first dates. I was so the king of first dates. It was not by choice. Uh, no, 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 no. I was trying. All right. Um, but uh, uh, what happened though was, uh, you know, so that was sort of like my dream of, of, of what a, if you were actually lucky enough to have a girlfriend what that would might be like yeah i mean do you think that some of those first dates now look at you and say wow why did i screw this up <laughs> yeah I, hopefully <laughs> <laughs> this script uh did it begin with a conversation between you and uma on the on the when you were making pulp fiction no it's exactly where it began i mean it's kind of wild to actually remember the exact moment that it happened especially with something that's taken 10 years to be made and that's exactly what happened um we were actually we'd been shooting pulp fiction and what would happen when there was a, it's, it's an interesting thing uma was in this kind of like a weird uh, situation in her life when we did uh, pulp fiction she had had like two not so great experiences on movies and you know she'd also had like some success like fairly early like almost at 16 or 17 on on movies so you know it's like you know when you worked hard to get something, it's something else. When it just kind of happens to you, it becomes something else, all right? And she had a couple bad experiences, so she was kind of talking like, maybe she's not gonna do movies anymore, all right? And uh, she goes, yeah, I think I'm gonna, I'll do your movie, Quentin, and then um, maybe I'll work a couple more times, you know, get some more money, maybe buy my apartment or something, and then, you know, maybe I'll do something else, you know? Yes. Hey, it's too silly a life to live, all right? <laughs> and, um, and so what happened was, we, you know, I had this weird thing going on where I was just like, I couldn't believe she was, didn't have more fun doing what she was doing because I'd been waiting to do this my whole life and I was having a blast on Pulp Fiction, yeah, all right? Exactly. So as I'm waiting for her to show up, I became this thing about me that like, it was almost as important to making a good movie as I was gonna make sure Uma had a good time during this process, all right? She was gonna enjoy this creative process. It's a damn shame she doesn't. And so I kind of worked 24 seven to make sure that happened. And, um, and we, you know, we really hit it off and had a great time. And then she was sort of like, then start changing a little bit as it went on, all right? I'm getting to what you're asking. Um, so changing a little bit where she was like, you know, you know, Quentin, I think, you know, maybe I, th I think I'm still gonna quit. But whenever you wanna make a movie, I'll come back, all right? And by the end of the movie, she was like, oh, I can't wait to work again. This is really great. But one night after shooting, you know, like you finish for the week and you go to a bar, you and the crew and you drink and you kind of unwind. And I remember exactly what bar it was. It was in Santa Monica. It's a bar called the Daily Pint, sort of a right. faux uh, British pub. And we were sitting there drinking pints. And I came up with the, I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing another movie, Uma. You'd be terrific for it is if we do a revenge movie. Now, Uma Thurman did not grow up watching exploitation movies, to <laughs> say the least. <laughs> all right. right. Her father's a professor. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, know, he might have watched some of that. I mean, you know, Bob is cool, all right. But uh, um, anyway, what happened was um, I started describing it to her about you'd be the female assassin. You'd be the deadliest woman in the world. And these people have screwed you over. And you're going to track them all down and kill them and everything. Yeah. And so we started web spinning. And as I'm describing and like, well, the way they always start is they always start with a person lying there and they're beaten up and they've killed their family and the people are looking down at them and everything. Um, and she goes, hey, Quentin, I have an idea. What about you see me, my face is all bloody and then the camera pans back and you realize I'm in a bridal gown. And that's when the bride was born. Yeah. That's when she became the bride. And then, uh, then she eventually came up even with the... Uh, uh, the first name of what the real name of the character is, all right? And then I proceeded to, like, write 30 pages. And then I kind of put it away. 
And then for the next like five years, every time I would see Uma, she was like say, so when are we going to do Kill Bill? When are we going to do Kill Bill? Well, I bump into her after not seeing her for two years, after I've been writing on this war script forever that I think is just becoming, you know, uh, my, I don't know what. Now, this is what, 99? Yeah, like this that. is about like a, a, God, yeah, 99. 99. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, 99 or 2000, one of the two. And, um, and I bump into her and she goes, so when are we going to do Kill Bill? I go, yeah, someday, someday. And I go home and I take the 30 pages out and I read it again. I go, this is damn good. And then just the idea of working with Uma again just seems so much fun as opposed to this weird vacuum that I was in. And I go, you know what? Let me go and do Kill Bill. And that'll, that'll, by taming Kill Bill, that'll teach me how to tame my war film. All right. And I'm thinking, I'm going to write it really quick. It's going to be this down and dirty exploitation movie, 90 minutes. All right. Uh, cut to four years later. We are now on Kill Bill Volume Two. All right. But, but how did it get to Volume Two? How did it get there? How did you end up with four hours? I couldn't. Stop, a, I couldn't stop of an writing. action adventure film. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there was this thing I felt, I mean, not pressure like I was under pressure per se, but I was putting pressure on myself that people hadn't read a Quentin script in a long time. So right, the next one that came out, I, I had to be proud of it and proud of it like a novel, not like a script. And I threw away all the script writing format crap and everything that I don't really like anyway, right. all right? And uh, and wrote it like a novel, all right? It's lots, tons of prose and, you know, and I'm doing my, coming up with my own way of writing scripts that are kind of weird. They're, they're not quite novels, but they're bigger than scripts. <laughs> and, um, and like, the page count is, like, crazy. Well, that's just because I didn't write it in a script format, all right? Now, it's funny. I still think that that's a very pleasurable way to read a piece of work. All right, having said that, I kind of see now, I'm like, I'm not writing a blueprint. I'm writing literature. All right. So uh, this is not for the production manager. It's for ever. All right. But then what happens is. This will live forever. Exactly. Uh, okay. Then I start realizing as I'm making this tomb, which, by the way, was so asinine that I actually wrote scenes in the script that I had no intention of shooting it that way. But on the page, it was better. It was so sweet. Yeah. On the page, it was like, well, in a novel, this is what I'd want it to happen. I'll change it in right. a movie. Day, all right. You were applying. Yeah. Yeah. And so the thing about it was, it got to be, as I'm making the movie, I'm realizing why people make blueprints as opposed to <laughs> writing novels, all right? Because basically, I literally had to adapt my movie from novel form to movie form yeah. every single day of a year of shooting. I just had a novel that I was adapting on the fly. <laughs> and so you end up with four hours? End up with four hours. Yeah, but did, yes. did you actually end up with four hours and then have, but, or did halfway through mm -hmm. shooting? Yeah. Uh -huh. Is that, how did it happen that you had a meeting with Harvey mm -hmm. Weinstein of uh, yeah. Miramax and he mm -hmm. says, you got two movies, or he, he confirms your instinct that you have two movies. Well, I was, you know, being a little bit self-delusional, all right? And um, what well, I was... What way were you being self-delusional? Well, I was keep talking myself into the idea. I figured maybe with 10 or 20 minutes left to spare that I would have to take out of the piece. Yeah. That if the first <laughs> if the first story okay, ended at, uh, you know, the first half of the movie ended at, at the 90 minute moment in Mark, okay, this would be after that snow garden fight right, with Lucy right. Liu. All right. Then that would give me an hour, an hour 10 maybe at the most to wrap up the rest of the movie. I thought there might be a way to do that. In all one right. movie? Yeah, 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 in one movie, in one movie. Okay, I have an hour to finish the story, <laughs> yes. all right? And so in the end, it'll be two hours and 10, 20 minutes. Yeah, no, no, it was going to be, I figured like 90 minutes for the other one and then uh, another hour, okay. all right, to wrap it up, all right? And so, you know, maybe three hours, maybe a little and less. And that's okay, that's, that's where you're delusional. Well, I, that was that. just the, that's just the price of doing business, all right? I figured so that was just the talking, only option we're I We're talking about a great script and we're talking about a genius, so why not? Yeah, but I mean, the thing about it is, you know, I wasn't I, I wouldn't have had the, the balls all yes. right to come out with a four hour like what they used to do in the 60s a road show print like battle of the bulge all right you would not the have had the balls to do that uh, no not really <laughs> you're quentin right. tarantino come on yeah it's like uh, that seemed kind of daunting all right uh and with an intermission in uh, the middle and okay, everything but is there also this that's part of your own mindset mm -hmm. you have got to be good this time out 
all right? Because you oh, yeah. created Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. Jackie Brown, which you liked a lot, did yeah. not get the same reception that mm -hmm. Pulp Fiction did. Right, you sure. know you've got to be good. You've yeah. done this acting thing and you've been having fun. You've been hanging out with yeah. Robert Rodriguez and other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But this has got to be good. Oh, no, that's Because Quentin's sure. got to say, mm -hmm. I have lost none of the juice that I had before. Yeah. But now, it's funny, though, because, I mean, I don't actually consider that, like, pressure in any negative sense or anything like that. It's like, I mean... You don't feel like you created a bar that you have to meet every time? Or oh, is no. that just where you think Oh, you, no, that's just that's where, where I belong. You, that's, that's, where, <laughs> that's where I belong, all right? Uh, all right. All right, you know, it is... Uh, no, I want to have... Hey, I have high expectations for myself, and I don't, I don't want to yeah. do slough off work and everything. And uh, I want to so, live up there. That's, that's where the minute... Uh, if I start living down here yeah. for, like, four films, then I quit. All right, then the only reason you haven't created more Pulp Fiction since you created Pulp Fiction... Mm -hmm is because you got off on this track took four years to write a to write the great world war ii classic that yeah. you have not yet found an ending for yeah well, i mean i've got an ending now and, 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 it, it actually did work though. it actually did work that yeah. kill bill did uh, kind of help me tame it all right so so you didn't feel like that you were losing anything you knew you had everything oh, going. i was working on right the there. script every all day right. it was blowing my mind okay so so you've got a film you think i can make this into three hours yeah, maybe I'm, I'm full of it but i'm telling myself yeah. i can and with with you know a little some few tears and a yeah. few bloodshed in there when it comes to taking stuff yeah, out right, it can make yeah. it work because that's just the way it was yeah, all right? right okay and then all of a sudden literally on the It'll last be... month of shooting harvey weinstein comes on the set right. and uh comes up to me and says um, you know quentin i uh I ain't like help me. you have to cut anything out of this movie um, now he's seen what uh he's, he's seen he a rough seen... cut no no we had it's just shooting yeah just just uh, he saw he saw some dailies okay he's, and, that's it yeah just a few dailies that's all now, is he thinking just commerce or is he thinking art no 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 he was like you know he was literally coming from I me mean, look now that everything's worked out great <laughs> all right as per usual harvey yeah. weinstein is the smartest guy in this town and hollywood all right <laughs> and but you, people thought he was an idiot exactly. all right and we and there was a gigantic chance sure. that we took on this i mean he didn't love the material so much yeah. that he said it's two movies he had to thought well look lord of the rings showed that you can have one film that becomes three exactly yeah yeah he you know he he uh, i mean admittedly there was some confidence there because exactly. we had a you know that a, the audience will not be turned off by the fact that one movie was filmed right. and became two yeah the, i mean the question literally was is it was it big enough to do it was it ah. substantial enough to do it i mean it's one thing to be a big epic like lord of the rings and do it right. and whatever you felt about the matrix it was an epic yeah exactly all right? and so uh you know it, it has some substantiality there all right to me i was more worried about the second half because like i knew i had my big battle scene at the end of volume one yes, yes. all right uh so will it will it bear but will it bear that kind of weight but the minute he brought it up uh i literally it was it was funny because i i was he, was he brought it up to me and then i go okay well let me go shoot this thing and let me think about it i come back about 45 minutes later and go okay harvey i figured it all out this is what we do and that's exactly what we ended up doing. So he was like a teddy bear about all this. Yeah, he was really, oh, he was wonderful about it. He, he encouraged it. All right, but, so here's the question, though. Do you have here mm -hmm. two movies, of mm -hmm. which everybody's raving about the second, mm -hmm. not everybody raved about the first, except aficionados of, who, yeah. who love the genre, the right, subgenre. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Those yeah. are the people who said, this is the better part of the two movies, right? Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. All right, but most people, mm -hmm. most average mu moviegoers mm -hmm. love the second, and the critics love the second mm -hmm. better than the first. Fair? Oh, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, it was more, more split down the middle with the first one, uh, you know, uh, okay. critics. But, yeah. All yeah. right. Fair. Can you, in your head, make an argument that I had one great movie here, one really great movie, and I ended up with two good movies? No, 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 I, I, not at all. As a matter of fact, I think one of the reasons, it would be very easy for them to say, oh, to say exactly what you said if they felt that way. One of the things that's happening that's really cool, and it's the only reason people are saying, oh, wow, visionary work or epic or whatever the hell there is they're saying, all right, <laughs> is the fact that, uh, <laughs> is they, it's like when you see volume two, you also kind of watch volume one again in your own mind and you see it as one big movie. When you watch volume two, you almost feel like you've just seen volume one yeah. and you've now seen the conclusion right. of the movie. And you know what's great? You can go get the DVD for volume one and watch it before you go into the theater to see volume two exactly and then one of the weird parts the, about this movie though this i mean it's really strange i'll ne i can't imagine ever making another movie that this would be apl applicable is just because of this weird way i did it and with all these little chapters and so mini movies inside of other mini movies it's like um it's it's open for many different ways to view the film 
All right, and what I mean by that is this. You can watch volume one, see that movie, and then you can go watch volume two and see that movie, and then that's one experience. If you were to watch it as one big four-hour movie with an intermission, you would have a different experience, but equally valid. How is it different? Well, it's just, but I'm not even finished yet because it's also the kind of thing that if, say, cereals were still a, 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 a right, right, profitable right. thing that you could do, you could literally release, it's like 10 chapters of this epic, all right? You could release one chapter in front of whatever new movie opened that week, yeah. all right, in the theaters, and at the end of 10 weeks, you would have seen Kill Bill. You would have had a different experience, but it would be no compromise in, the, you know, in that experience. Do you have a sense about where you are in your life and what you're doing that, that just simply, I got two damn much to do. Mm -hmm. You got too many ideas, too many things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so that the task for you is to focus? Yeah, well, it's, it, it actually proves now to be kind of problematic in writing because when I get my imagination started, it's just really hard to stop it. And in the case of both, I mean, there's all this stuff that I wrote for Kill Bill that just never even, I never even bothered typing it up, all right? Because it already was big enough as it was. All these different avenues I could have gone down and stuff. And same thing with the last two couple things I wrote. And um, it's like, what am I trying to do? Make movies that are bigger than movies? All right. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, I've seen a lot of really great movies and they seem to be able to get it done in time. All right. You know, yeah, I never really right. wanted to transcend movies. I wanted to empower movies. <laughs> yes. All right. But when I start writing, I write these crazy novels and I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> well, write a novel. That's I what guess. you can do. Write yeah. a novel and don't make a movie out of it. Let, give me the ideas that, that, that spawn Kill Bill beyond the notion Mm -hmm. uh, of all the movies you had seen, yeah. was there one or two that inspired Kill Bill beyond the notion of the opening scene where somebody has been yeah, yeah. badly damaged mm -hmm. and they set out to do, do in the people who did them? Yeah, it's like, you know, I, I, there, there is this uh, kind of fun aspect where at some point, but even way back when I was even talking about it with Uma, that this would be my exploitation movie, all right, where I empower and, and hopefully, you know, uh, make other people see exploitation movies but you through my eyes. you wanted to make eyes. the best exploitation movie ever oh, made. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I wanted to make, yeah, I wanted to make the big man move of the exploitation movies, <laughs> all right? And, you know, if you like them, then, okay, here, here yeah, it right, is, right. baby. If this is what you want, I got it for you. In yeah, exactly. And the thing is, by doing a chapter style, you can kind of, like, you know, uh, change the format every time when it comes to a new chapter. But also, with a revenge movie, where basically, we've all seen revenge right. movies a million times, all right? Uh, you've got, like, five people on the list, you're going to track them all down. Well, I was able to do a thing where, like, revenge movies, well, you know, every other, every third kung fu movie is a revenge movie, every third samurai movie, every third spaghetti western exactly. is a revenge movie, all right? right? So thus, I'm able to deal with all these different subgenres that I love and everything, all in the course of this one story. And each person on her death list, you know, whether it be Lucy Liu's Oreni, she E, right. or Vivica Fox, and like, brings the kind of Pam Greer movies into the film, right. all right? Each, each person kind of represents a different genre. Right. And so what, so what then happens in the second? Mm -hmm. so, so the second, yeah. volume two, is just about killing Bill. Yeah. Well, she's got two other people on the list she's got yeah. to take care of, all right? But it's uh, really about killing uh, Bill. Well, it's about heading, heading towards Bill. Yeah. And the thing is, there was an aspect where on volume one, what I was all about on volume one is boiling down a revenge movie to its very essence. I mean, like I said, I just described what a revenge a lot movie is. We've all seen it, right. all right? I don't need to keep... Uh, emphasizing a story when you know what the story is, all right? <laughs> yes. So I'm able to kind of make a cool little action movie where I take all the boring scenes, all right? And we yeah. just go to the high points. And, um, but also, it was my chance to really prove to myself more than anybody else, to prove to myself that uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a top director, that I can do action, because I've always considered action directors are like probably the greatest cinematic directors, all right? And even actors, even directors who, who like maybe don't just do action, but can do action beautifully, like say like Francis Ford Coppola in the helicopter sequence of Apocalypse right, Now. Right. I mean, that's just to me Choreography. The, 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 the pinnacle of movie making, all right, that sequence. And if I'm, and I've never really done that before. So if I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, I'm going to like throw it in. I want to throw it in with the big boys. I don't want to be okay. I want to be as good as them, if not better. Not saying I am, but that's the goal. Yeah. All right. And um, and at the end of it all, since I know action scenes and I know what gets me off. All right. Then it's like if I didn't do it, I would know it. All right. And I was like, okay, uh, I guess I'm not as so, good. As, I'm not as good as I think I am. Stick to the dialogue. But there was an aspect about it that but, was quite thrilling. Of Testing to see if I would hit the head, hit my head on the ceiling of my okay, own talent. Did you do it? I mean, in other words, did you hit the head on the ceiling or did you not? And in mm -hmm. fact, and you well, tell me. Uh, 
I you did I not think in I, your judgment. No, I think I did it. Yeah, you, I, you hit the head on the ceiling. In other words, you went as far. You were as good as you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hitting the head on the ceiling means like you've got you've you've, you've stopped it. yourself. All right. right? Uh, you know, I think that the House of Blue Leaves fight sequence, that battle sequence at the end, is, is, is as good as, as anything I've ever seen action wise. Is that right? Yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. Yeah. What action movie informed you other than the helicopter scene? in terms of what you thought was the epitome? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, well, the helicopter scene was where I started. But also, there's a, uh, in particularly in that sequence, there's a, it's a, it's a staple of the old Shaw Brothers uh, uh, kung fu films of like the one against a hundred fight. It yeah. usually happens either in a restaurant or happens in a casino, <laughs> all right? Where Jimmy Wang Yu or whoever comes in and they send all yeah. the guys and they all yeah. have butcher knives yeah. and you know, whatever, and they takes them all on, all right? And that's a classic, classic scene in many kung fu movies and like a couple of the movies that really informed that was uh the, um this one jimmy wang Yu movie called um uh the chinese boxer which has a fantastic actually the first of those one against a hundred fights all right uh, in a casino that's fantastic there's another movie shang shay who is literally like the john ford of uh, old school martial art films as shaw brothers did a film called vengeance which was sort of his version and of point scene blank in that? and there's a scene where this guy uh where the um uh, um, uh, tai Lung, who is in The Killer, uh, is murdered. But the thing is, before he's murdered, he fights like a hundred guys. And it, they even have a sequence in it in The American Prince, where at a certain point it gets so bloody, it goes to black and white. Yeah. You know, and uh, I was like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then I actually saw the actual Chinese version of it, and they never go to black and white. <laughs> I go, well, hell, I can take that. <laughs> All right, let me switch to casting. we got to see a clip first. Let, let's take a look at a clip, because otherwise I'll get lost here. <laughs> this is where uh, Bud tells his brother Bill, who's David Carradine, that the bride is coming mm -hmm. for the revenge. That woman deserves her revenge. And we deserve to die. But <laughs> then again, so does she. Tell me about you and Uma. Do you know of any relationship between a director and a star mm -hmm. that's the same? Does any of that influence you? Do you look with all of your knowledge of movies, mm -hmm. in the same way you know all these scenes, mm -hmm. and think about, mm -hmm. I mean, are you in some guru way mm -hmm. shaping a career... And a, and a person that you have sort of total emotional and intellectual mm -hmm. admiration for. Um, I, I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would say. How would you say it? I, I don't know if I would say shaping. I mean, if I am, she's equally uh, shaping okay, me. Okay, but right, um, go ahead. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny. I, I mean, the one the example I keep looking towards. All right, is uh, the way uh, uh, Joseph von Sternberg and Marlena Dietrich. All right, had their relationship. All right, and then there's a little bit. Even though if I say it, people go ooh la la because they were married, and that's not where I'm coming from. But uh, the way uh, uh, Jean Luc Godard and Anna Karenina, all right, had their relationship on on cinema, and. I'm and one. Me and Uma are friends. We could never make a movie together again, and that would just be okay. Would still always be friends. All right, but I like that team partnership thing, all right, that the screen teams, you know? And, I, and Uma's not the only person I have it with. I have it with Sam Jackson, too. I have it with quite a few right. people, all right? Um, but the thing is, you know, with Uma, it is, it, it's, it, it, it's special. And the man-woman aspect of the director and the actress is a very special aspect to this. And I do hearken back to uh, wanting to treat her like the way von Sternberg treated Dietrich and show her off in the best way. And one of the things about Uma that can be prob problematic with her when she gets cast in other movies and stuff is, you know, she's just such so ravishing, all right? That like, yeah. uh, like for instance, okay, if I'm going to do a movie that's supposed to be a realistic movie about a, a waitress in a, in a coffee shop, all right, uh, you know, it seems weird to cast Uma. In that, that sounds Hollywood. Oh, what wet waitress in a coffee shop looks like Uma Thurm. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, now she actually just did this uh, HBO movie, Hysterical Blindness, which plays this like yeah. Jersey girl, and she was fantastic exactly. in it. So right. she's showing me how wrong I am. But yeah. you know what? You, yeah, you know my right, point. Right, right. All right. But the way von Sternberg, when he's going to do a movie with Dietrich, you know, he built it around her. He knew her physicality. He knew what she could do. He wanted to bring out different aspects about her. All right. When you're writing something for Uma and want it to be, you know, the Uma show. All right. Uh, you know, I can write for I can write for her that 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 willowy physicality she has. I mean, as 
as I'm writing it on, she's going to look like the bomb in that yellow tracksuit. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, I put her I in Bruce that. Lee's tracksuit. All of a sudden, it's not Bruce Lee's anymore. <laughs> all right. And then, you know, her long blonde hair and you know, those arms that are all elbows and, yeah, you know, those yeah. legs that are all kneecaps. And she just kind of like <laughs> bends with the wind as she's fighting with a strike. Oh, that'll look great. All right. And I try to, you know, push her strings and actually take her in slightly different directions. Do you like the idea that there is the mystery of people don't quite know what the relationship is? Yeah, well, yeah. Th no, th there is a little bit about that. I mean, the problem I have with it is people always trying to ask us to define it. I mean, one thing that's happened that's been kind of a drag is, you know, I said, oh, she's my muse. Right. All right. Well, I meant that. All right. I completely. And mean what did that. you mean by that? Well, I guess, you know, what I meant is she's inspired me, especially when right, it comes to right, this movie. Right. All right. You know, I mean, she completely and utterly inspired me. If Uma's mother never met Uma's father, there'd be no Kill Bill. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Having true. having said that, though, but. I was also and I meant every word of it. I was also paying her a poetic compliment, right. too. And now you go a press junket and then everybody asks that. All right? right. And all of a sudden now they're dissecting it. Right. And this this poetic compliment is being put under a microscope and all the poetry is being drained out exactly of it. Right. And it's kind of a drag. I agree with you. But I but you're not asking that. But no, I'm not asking that. That's right. But I, I mean, it is just it's you just know that there's some dynamic here mm -hmm. that's not normally there. Yeah. It is the dynamic is from that you reflected on with Marlena Dietrich, mm -hmm. but it, and is also somebody that inspires you yeah. to be better than you are, and you inspire her I, to be. I, I I agree. I mean, she. I mean, uh, uh, I don't really want to nail what it is I bring out of her or what she brings right, out right. of me because I don't really know to tell exactly you the truth. Right. But I know it when I see it. Yeah. When and you know, know when you feel it. Yeah, and when I feel, or even when I watch the work and everything, it's like, oh, you know, uh, I'm a little different when I work with Uma, and she's a little different when she works with me. She is the best of her. What? Finish it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think, uh, I think when it comes to uh, uh, modern actresses right now, and she's, 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 as, she's as good as it gets. I mean, as one, good as it gets. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I, I think Uma can go. If, if um, here's the thing. All right. If Uma is is comfortable making the movie, if she's mm -hmm. comfortable, if she has, if she, if she is, if she's having a, a good type, a good rapport with the other actors, more or less, and having a good rapport with the director, more or less, and particularly the director. All right. If she's having a good rapport and she's comfortable, you know, her work can stand up against every, anybody's. All right. But now, but but that's not the whole deal, though, because you have that. But then you add on the fact that she's the only actress, as far as I'm concerned, that has the true silver screen nitrate film glimmer. <laughs> all right. Of the, yeah. you know, I can make the Dietrich analogy with no problem whatsoever. I can make the Garbo analogy. Not only that, it almost becomes weird. Like, God, Uma would probably even be a bigger star if she was in the 30s. Yeah. Because that I was the you. time that people like Uma Thurman ruled Hollywood. All right. Roll tape. This is a scene with Uma. And, you know, there, well, there's one more aspect about Uma that I think we should bring up, especially right. after watching that clip and what we were talking about. Is you know what? As opposed to a lot of actresses out there, she's lived a life. Yeah, she just Uma Thurman has lived a life, all right? You know, her parents gave her a big deal life, all right? right? And her family and her brothers and then her own adventures that she's gone on. And she hasn't just lived her life on movies. She didn't sets. start on movies when she was seven and then yeah. ended up with and then, no or, other experience. Or doing, you know, all these movies back to back to back to back to back. So all she knows about life is her trailer and, you know, and the sets and everything. You know, she has an intellectual curiosity that's pretty much second to none, all right? And um, an intellectual curiosity second to none among the people you know yeah yeah exactly exactly i mean just i mean I, you know i mean this person might be this but you know her curiosity is right there all right let me see while we're doing this one more scene to get this in this is where she tells uh bill that she never thought he would have tried to kill her roll mm -hmm. tape here it is an important part of this movie could you do what you did of course you could but i never thought you would or could do that to me. I'm really sorry, kiddo. But you thought wrong. You have a reputation for taking actors and maybe actresses, certainly actresses too, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, and in a sense, because of the way you cast them and the performance they deliver for you, mm -hmm. it reinvigorates their options yeah. for performances and character roles. Mm -hmm. You've clearly done this for Carradine. I mean, why did you know? What was it about him mm -hmm. that made him right for this? Well, it's funny because I'd, um, I've always thought of David Carradine as like a, a magnificent actor. I mean, literally one of the like one of those great mad genius actors of Hollywood. Yeah, you yeah, with the, the yeah. Nicholson and everything, and <laughs> yeah, uh, <exactly>. and <laughs> that's a perfectly way to say it. And uh, and you know, I've always you know, and, and the thing is, you know, uh, I've I've kind of followed his career, and even when he does like these crappy exploitation movies, not all of them are crappy, by the way. But when he does them, you know, he's always delivering the goods. He's got that great mm -hmm. old pro mm -hmm. quality, and mm -hmm. he's got that you know whatever. Anyway, the thing is. As I was writing the script, I ended up uh, uh, getting his book, or he wrote an autobiography called Endless Highway. And it is fantastic. His life, imagine, you know, being John Carradine's son and all that right, stuff. Right. He has lived a life worthy of a Charles Dickens novel. And his writing is really good. So he writes it like Kerouac meets Charles Dickens, all right, <laughs> which is quite good, all right? Yes. And I was going on his life journey with him. And as I'm reading it more and more and getting more and more fascinated with it, I'm like, God, he would be a fantastic Bill. I mean, forget about all the Kung Fu analogies and all that stuff. That all ended up playing into it. But in reading the book, and, I, you know, it's like, God, he, he could be Bill. And I even had a, a, a compadre when it came to that. I gave uh, uh, um, Ethan Hawke the book to read. He loved it. And he goes, Quentin, this is your Bill. This guy's Bill. <laughs> <laughs> After you thought about the idea and you, yeah. you're looking for confirming sort of sense. Well, I just actually wanted Ethan, Ethan loves to read. I wanted, you got to read this great book. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Now, the I, what did you hope for between the chemistry between the two of them? Mm -hmm. The chemistry between these two people, especially in a scene like that? Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, you know, I always wanted Bill to be older. I wanted him to be more like a, a teacher, older mentor, fa father figure right. kind of figure. But, you know, they obviously were lovers. And, you know, you know, it's dicey when you're playing with this younger girl, older guy thing, all right? So I wanted there to be sizzle. In fact, there had to be, or it'd be nice try, but no cigar, Yeah. all right? And I said- Without the sizzle, the movie was not as good. Yeah, well, the last thing in the world you want is like, Umina goes to kiss Dave, and the audience goes, ugh. Yeah, I know. You know, uh, like, and I've, I've been to those movies. Yeah, I've seen I've that, been, and I've heard- And sometimes you know, they're married. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so- <laughs> Uh, yes. I've actually said that about a good manager. Like, they have no chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you, you you wanted to, and when did you know you had it? Well, to tell you uh, the truth, I I felt I had it on the day, or else I'd probably still be there shooting it. But I didn't really 100% slam dunk no until we edited those scenes together. Because one of the things I wanted to do is. It had this whole organic thing, like everything in its own time. It was going to be the journey that was going to tell us everything. You know, the writing of the movie, that journey would tell us, tell me what I needed to do when it came to the writing the scene between Bill and the Bride. Same thing of a shooting of it. All right. We would do that the last thing. So by the time we got to shoot it, shoot it we would be informed by everything exactly. we've exactly. done. Right. But you know right. what? That was the same thing about the editing. I didn't let my editor, Sally Minky, who's worked in all my movies, don't do any assembly on the Bill and Bride stuff. We have to cut the whole movie together and then we'll do the Bill and Bride scene. So I didn't know if I had my ending truthfully, like slam dunk in my pocket until yeah. at the end of this process, I cut those scenes together. And how did you feel when you saw it? I felt pretty good. I, was, I felt right. kind of relieved. All right. I want to go to one thing here. These, the, back to this relationship quickly because we've got this on tape. This is Uma mm -hmm. talking about the relationship between you and her on this show. Roll tape. You yes. give him a rule, he'll break it. You yeah. know, I mean, he, he's, it's, it's actually the great genius of being a self-taught, self-created person is that nobody ever... Nobody ever told him probably or encouraged him that he could be good at something, you know, that he would be good at something when he was young and, and, and how to do it. So since he probably, I mean, I don't, you know, can't speak for him, but he, he had to teach himself everything. So he's completely original. He's, his imagination, his freedom creatively. He certainly trusted me a lot and, and has given me huge challenges. Um, and that is an invaluable thing. I mean, when somebody believes in you and trusts you and um, throws on your shoulders, you know, the power to change, change yourself, to do something completely different you've never done before, it's, it's, it's a real gift for the actor. Right. What's the most important thing you've learned from Quentin? Hmm. Um, what would be the most important thing I've learned from Quentin? 
You know, he always surprises me. I, I, um, I, I, I don't know. He, um, he, he once said that uh, I gave him wisdom and he gave me courage. And uh, I can't speak to any wisdom that could have possibly uh, come from me to him or where it's landed or, or what, it, or if, whether I possess any. But um, yeah. he certainly, I certainly had to find a lot of courage and more than I knew I had. Um, in this in this adventure in this in this battle that was this movie um, so yeah courage. I guess he gave me courage that's what you were gonna say yeah I, I, didn't, I didn't know that was what she was gonna say and that was the first thing that came to my mind is you give her wisdom she gives you you give her courage she gives you wisdom yeah. wisdom how does she give you wisdom I don't know how you describe that right. but she's right. why well said <laughs> uh, congratulations on Kill Bill Volume 2. Thanks. There is going to be Kill Bill Volume 3? Uh, one of the things I'm going to do, yes, is, uh, uh, one, it's going to take about a decade for me <laughs> to, like, recover <laughs> from this one, all right? Uh, but one thing that's actually really cool about when, like, you know, one, I like the idea of being an artist and being able to do this anyway, is, um, you know, I own my characters, so I can kind of do whatever I want with them, all right? And also that is like... You create them, you own them. I own them, yeah. And Uma is something I'm going to know for, like, the rest of my life. So I can make long-range plans, all right? And one of the things that's really cool is I think 15 years from now, I want to go back to this character, all right? And what I want to do is tell the story of, of Vivica Fox's daughter, Nikki, all right? She spent the last 15 years getting ready to go and kill the bride, all right? And then I'm going to follow her journey as she tries to go and, and track Uma down and kill her. And it's very interesting because it's like, you know, uh, Nikki, the little girl, she deserves her revenge just as much as Uma deserved hers. And that will be the only way that the whole revenge cycle that started in this movie can ever end. And then it becomes a trilogy. Yes, exactly. Good. But there's one other last thing. Okay. And that's, I love the bride. I, I mean, I really love the bride. And she deserves some peace. She's fought so long and she's gone through so much. I want to be able to let her put her sword on her shelf and let it sit there for a long time and not contrive some BS for her to take it down. She deserves a good life until, you know, 15 years from now. I want her to have 15 years of peace. The name of the World War II movie, which may be coming at some point, is called... Inglorious in, Bastards. Inglorious Bastards. And we now have an ending for that. Is that what you're going to shoot next? Or yeah, that'll, that'll probably be exactly what I do next. I mean, the only thing that's out there, i got to wait till I kind of chill out a little bit after this movie yeah. and stuff, is maybe I want to, like, do some five-week movie or something, some, some movie in between going onto another mountain. Yeah, right. Sort like, of what Kill Bill started yeah, out. Yeah, that's exactly what it started out to be. But I had a really interesting conversation. I, um, I met uh, uh, Ellie Coppola, Francis right. Ford Coppola's right. wife, and um, she just asked one question, like, you know, like the people ask, you know, like, oh, so what are you going to do next? So I ended up, like, really answering the question, all right? And I'm describing, well, look, you know, I've just been on climbing Mount Everest, and I don't know, do I want to climb Mount Everest again my next movie? And so I'm trying to figure out, do I want to do that? And she sits there, and she's listening to everything I say. And then when it's all over with, she goes, well, um, I think maybe this is your time to climb Mount Everest. You're at the age to climb Mount Everest. You're at the passion to climb Mount Everest. There'll come a time that you won't want to climb Mount Everest anymore. I think this is your mountain climbing days. I think she's right. I think she is, too. Thanks, Fred. Great to see you. Good to see you, too. Pleasure. Quentin Tarantino for the hour. Kill Bill, Volume 2. You can also buy Kill Bill, Volume 1, and take a look at it before you go see Kill Bill, Volume 2 at the theaters. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.